Welcome back to Monroe Live. Now, unfortunately today, we are relegated to a small corner of the shop space. Uh, when you see videos on Monroe Live, those are normally media vehicles that we can have a look at, or they are cars that we have purchased ourselves and torn down to be able to sell that information to our customers or to make videos on. The things that we actually do for customers, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to show you. Those things are segregated off. So it's, it's kind of hard to really show you what we are doing because we can't show you what we are doing. That's when you see all of the blackboards up in the background of our videos. We are full right now today, so we are in this small little corner. But today we're looking at the Hyundai Santa Fe Hybrid. This is the calligraphy edition. I don't really know what that name entails, what type of a trim it entails. Now, we're looking at this. This is a $50,000 SUV, and this is a three row SUV. Overall, it's kind of boxy, but it's not bad. Um, I do kind of like that matte finish. Again, whenever I do reviews, I always prefer the vehicle to have a light or cream interior. Why? Because all of the detail can be seen. The windows are up, the doors are closed, but yet you can still see the detail of that interior. So it just shows up much better on camera. I really do like it. Now, another thing that I want to talk about is whenever we have research and innovation or feature changes within a vehicle, sometimes they change things up and they want something to be used in a slightly different way. That's okay. When I review these vehicles for you on Monroe Live, normally this is the very first time I've seen the vehicle. I have not sat in this for a half hour prepping before we do the video. What you see is what I see for the first time for the most part. Now, I was kind of curious, I saw this little feature here. This is just something that I have not seen before. That little door presses in and it appears to be a handle. There's one on each side. I'm thinking, okay, an exterior handle. What is this? Is this to help me get into the vehicle? Well, I don't think so, because if I was trying to climb into this vehicle, where am I going to put my foot? I'm going to put my foot forward of the seat. Now, if I need help getting into this vehicle, more than likely I'm a smaller person. If I'm standing over there and trying to reach over here, that's too awkward. I would not be able to get into the vehicle. Am I using this as a handle while I try and reach something that might be on an overhead rack? Well, there's a possibility. If I'm standing here, standing on a tire, lifting myself up to get to the roof, maybe. Or there may be some complete other use for this little pocket that I don't, am not aware of, but it's just something that I wanted to mention. The styling of the vehicle on the interior is actually very attractive. Mixed. Um, pieces that I do believe are actually painted, not really chrome. There may be, there is a technique where they'll actually chrome apart and then you'll do a translucent paint coating over top of the chrome to kind of dull it. I don't like that technique just because you could just get almost the exact same finish just using paint. So it's a very expensive process that could be done less expensive. I think for this vehicle and this price point, more than likely this is just painted. Now, those colors, the cream I've already made mention of, nice and light, I like the look of that. But I don't know if it shows up on camera, this is not black. This looks to be green. So this is a dark green, almost like a army khaki green with the cream. It's a color combination that I would not expect. Um, normally you wanna have a high runner component that would just be black like the top pad would be black on every vehicle we sell and then we just change this color well that means that there must be a green version and more than likely there is a black version as well so all of the doors the base background would have to be injection molded in multiple colors now why is that a problem if i have a tool so there is a tool that makes that door and i'm pressing in my injection mold and resin the resin and the color goes through the injection molding screw into the press. If I'm now changing the color, like let's say I was making black parts and now I want to make these green parts. I have to purge everything that's inside of that machine out. And think about if you're a child playing with Play-Doh and you have those little play sets that press Play-Doh through a mold. 
every once in a while you get little bits of a color that you'd used previously that comes out and mixes in with your play-doh and eventually your play-doh all becomes brown or some sort of a janky color you have to purge all of the black out of that injection molding machine before you can injection mold that green door the way you would do that is you would just start pumping in resin and pushing it out onto the ground to try and rinse out the injection molding screw you could use up to 200 pounds of resin trying to completely cycle out to switch out a part if that part is made out of two pounds of resin all right that means that i've wasted the material for a hundred parts just to switch over to make a different color so how many different colors do i want <laughs> hopefully you don't have more than three otherwise every time you have to change that color you're wasting a lot of material now you can save yourself by batch building so what is batch building it means well today we're just going to make a thousand green doors and that's all we're going to make are green doors okay but now you have to store a thousand green doors when your assembly line may only make five to ten green door vehicles per day the storage fees end up eating into your costs so for me, when I'm ever looking at something from a cost perspective, I'm looking at the entire process, not just the cost to make one single part, but my processing costs that enable me to make that one part. My batch size matters on if I'm doing five different colors, what is my batch size? What is my storage space for all those different batches based on how many of I'm making per day? So I look at all of that. Back to the actual vehicle this decoration here now we've talked about this in the past i do believe that this is an in mold film so this is an injection molded part that has a film that is put into the mold to give you that type of decoration the great thing about that is this film just like taking it out of a printer i could change this between every single part and not have any issue so my base injection molded part would be the same for every one and i would just change the film there's no changeover cost for that that is a great way of doing it however now having a film plus my injection molding part i've increased the cost of every single part my burden on my full cost of having a film now is on every vehicle and i have to have it because more than likely my injection molding tool does not have a surface that is grained and capable of being a a surface part without a film on it so all those little things i'm thinking about on cost and what is happening there Again, this is fairly attractive. I kind of like this. All right, so we have this cream white top, but look at the buttons and my power. They've actually done those in the same color. Normally, all of these would be black because it would be the same on every vehicle that they sell. I kind of like the look of being able to have that changed for this individual vehicle, but I know that that adds costs. So there are a couple of storage bins in front of the passenger seat, one in the top here, and this is very similar to what you'll see on a Ford truck. Traditionally, a glove box release will actually have a handle that you will lift up. Now, the, think about the kinematics of how that handle is working. If I'm lifting that handle up, I'm applying force basically against the hinge or in to the vehicle. And then I am controlling how that door is coming down we had a vehicle the other day where the glove box handle went sideways and it was just awkward for functioning well this one the glove box handle pulls towards you now it's unique it's neat but think about it if this is pulling towards me and i don't want its opening to be uncontrolled i have to keep a finger on it to support it so if whatever i happen to have in this glove box is very very heavy then having a handle that functions by pulling towards me is just going to slam down harder and harder. And that's going to be hard on the hard stops if it's on the glove box. It's a unique feature. It's an attractive feature. But I don't think that it's an intuitive feature. I think a handle that allows me to support its weight while I'm lowering it down would be more practical. When I first looked at these seats, they looked stiff. They looked uncomfortable. But the more I sit in this seat, I'm actually quite comfortable. I, I like it a lot. Now, of course, I have not turned on this vehicle to actually see what its power functions are, the types of ventilation, things like that. 
And honestly, I hate all heated seats, so I don't even care if it's a heated seat at all. But I think that it is a comfortable, attractive seat. Now, I don't know how recently I've talked about this. When I was lighter, um, I was the perfect 90th percentile male. So when we were developing seats, they would always bring me down and I would sit in the seats that we were modeling the foam on, modeling the covers, what the structure was going to be. And I would sit in the seat and I would close my eyes and we would describe, I would describe exactly what I was feeling on all the different points of my body, how I'm feeling the bolsters touch into my side, where I'm feeling my back moving away from the seat. Where are the hard parts? How is the headrest mating? All of those things matter towards your comfort and how long you're actually going to want to be in your vehicle. Think about it. For me, I keep all of my vehicles to at least 250,000 miles. 250,000 miles of sitting in that seat. I said this when we were talking about the Tesla Model S. Is that seat a pleasure or is it a prison sentence? If that seat is not comfortable, 250,000 miles on that seat, it's just not a pleasurable experience. So having a good, functional, comfortable interior to me is the most important. I care about the interior more than I care about the looks of the exterior because I sit in this interior. I guess you could say I'm a hedonist. This is all about my pleasure and my comfort. I don't care what people think about the exterior looks when I'm driving by. So for a three row vehicle, here is my second row seat. This is not a bench, it just has an open path to be able to get to the rear into the third row. This style of seating is always less comfortable, unfortunately. And since these seats have to function, they have to fold flat. Normally the bolsters are cut into them. Normally the backs sit up much straighter, more vertical. So I can't really get as comfortable as I can in a front seat. Where that causes if you have someone who's very, very tall and you're sitting very, very vertical and then this vehicle has some sort of jounce or some sort of vibration, this is where people start to get seasick in the back of their own vehicles. So that can be a problem. So normally for a second row occupant, the only really type of storage you have is if there is a center armrest, but of course this has an open path, there is no center armrest. So we have storage in the door. You'll notice that there are two cup holders on each side. So this is one seating position, but yet two cup holders on the door. However, look at that bottom cavity in the door. And if you zoom in on the logo, you'll see that that also fits a bottle. So that means that there's three cup holders on each door per seating position. So if you're in a very, very long trip, um, I guess you can drink from the bottles from the top and then fill a bottle that might be in the bottom. <laughs> but going into your storage space, so I have my cup holders, I have a map pocket, fairly rigid map pocket, not a lot of room for me, but here's something that might be somewhat unique. Here, part of the front center console storage is actually accessible from the rear occupant. That is kind of cool so let's say you're back here and you're a kid and you want to plug in your phone plug in your ipad the wires can all be stored right there um, that is convenient now here's one that i might not agree with as much here is your center armrest the center armrest does hinge and fold from the front but yet i can also hinge this and get into it from the rear if I am the driver, I do not want whoever is sitting behind me opening up the armrest that I might be using that now I'm fighting with the kids because I had moved the armor out of the way while I'm trying to drive the car. It's a neat feature. Is it a practical feature and is it a feature that I actually want in my vehicle? No. Now you may have a large family that you need to use three rows all the time. The more I talk to people who have a three row vehicle and I ask, what is it for? They will actually say, well, when I go to get my kids' friends and I'm driving them all in the vehicle, when I'm going to pick up the grandparents, I can put the kids in the back and the grandparents are gonna sit in the rear. 
okay, that makes sense. Which means that for the most time, you are not actually using this third row seat. Third row seat's still there, okay. But for the most part, this is just going to be cargo space. So pull straps, fold down the seat, nice big cargo space. Since that is not a bench up front, that means that this cargo, whatever I put here and I hit the brakes, could possibly fly up into the passenger compartment, but that will exist for any three row vehicle that does not have some sort of a divider in the center there. Look, two more cup holders. So we have four seating positions back here and we have six, seven, eight, nine, ten cup holders for the four seating positions. Third row AC controls. Now I've worked with some vehicles where they fight to try and figure out how to get ducting back to the third row, whether it's running from the center console underneath the carpet floor back here. If they're running it up into the quarter trim, if they have to run it along the headliner, that's just getting AC back there, some sort of a duct to provide ventilation. Having actual controls is a little more unique. I just folded down those seats by using the strap. But I have the second row seats that are still in the way. Those seats are powered and I'm able to fold them down from out behind the vehicle. So I guess I'll end this by saying, I am from Flint, Michigan, the birthplace of General Motors. My family has worked for General Motors and other automotive companies in the area since basically the 1930s. I have a lot of history in American OEMs, both GM, Ford, Chrysler. I have an appreciation for them. I have a lot of criticism for them. So when I see a vehicle like this, which traditionally I would have picked on, picking on Hondas 10, 20 years ago, okay. But this, at a $50,000 price point, three row vehicle, the type of comfort that I had in this vehicle, the type of styling that I see in this vehicle, I can't complain about that. And I cannot make fun of that. I think that this is a very, very nice vehicle. Would I buy one? Still, no, because I still have the prejudice with being in this type of automotive industry and my own family history. But seeing this does make me more upset with some of the traditional OEMs, traditional North American OEMs that I am more familiar with. I can't see these types of offerings in some of those vehicles at that price point. So thank you very much for watching Monroe Live and have a wonderful day.